Um, this is take two. Last time I finished the video, I went to save it, and then my computer crashed. But I'm not bitter. All right, so let's take a look at um, what's going on here. So number one, two grains of salt carry a charge of 3.4 times 10 to the negative 14th. They're separated by a distance of 0.35 meters. What's the electric force between the two grains? All right, so um, in, in this being in a review sheet, we may be using Coulomb's law. We may be using charge quantization. Uh, we may be using some of these constants that are up here. So how do I know to use this formula? All right, Coulomb's law. Well, first of all, we're dealing with two things that are charged. It doesn't matter if they're, you know, they're grains of salt or whatever. It just matters that I've got two charges here. So Q1, Q2. If I've got this equation, Q equals NE, I've only got one charge there. So I can't really, I can't deal with that one. So that limits it to this. Other way to look at this is I've got distance. No other, no other formula here has distance in it. And remember, this isn't a formula. This is part of the unit for the K constant for Coulomb's law. Um, so it looks like it's a formula at first just because it's so weird, but it's not a formula. Um, and the last way to look at that is it's asking us for what's the electric force. Um, so I'm looking for a force. Q equals N. He does not have a force in there. All right. After we limit it down to the equation, it's fairly straightforward from there in terms of where we drop our variables in. 9 times 10 to the 9th is always there. right? That That is K. And it stays constant. It doesn't change, right? So that's 9 times 10 to the 9th. And that'll be the same for every problem that has K in it. Um, our charges are both from this. Because it's a, they, they both carry a charge of 3.4 times 10 to the negative 14. So that's why I've written it twice here. Normally these won't be the same value. It just so happens in this particular problem they, they are. Um, my distance is 0.35 meters. My distance is separation. So that's where I'm getting this 0.35 from. And then the squared is actually part of the formula, so that's why I have the, the squared in there. And that'll always be in there, right? So now at this point, doing those three numbers, um, multiplying them out, coming up with a little sub-answer. And then on the bottom here, go ahead and you know do your 0.35 times 0.35 or 0.35 squared. Either way, it's the same thing, right? And then divide the two, and that's how you get this answer. Now, sometimes you'll come out with a really weird exponent, like negative fiftieth or positive fiftieth or something like that. You know, thirty-fifth. It's like those are those are really high numbers. Anything past you know to the thirty-fifth power, you're you're not going to see anything like that. If you do come out with something like that, it means that most likely what you did is you probably did your problem okay. But you plugged into the calculator as, let's say, for example, 3.4 times 10 to the negative 14th. You ended up plugging in your calculator as that, when really you want to plug as 3.4 and then hit second and then common. That gives you the E key, stands for exponent. 3.4 times 10 to the, and that's what the E stands for, times 10 and the caret, negative 14. So when your calculator sees this, it recognizes it as all one big number, and it doesn't have to worry about the parentheses. In fact, it actually programmatically looks at it and, and, and puts parentheses there for you automatically without you even having to do it. Um, not in the actual screen, but in the software. Now, when you look at a, a number like this, your cal it looks like it's two different problems, right? Two different uh, numbers, 3.4 and... 10 to the negative 14th then multiplying the two and it is to the calculator so you need to make sure that you have that in parentheses so the calculator realizes that this is all one big number um, some cases won't matter if you have it in parentheses or not other cases it will it's kind of a crapshoot so if in doubt throw the parentheses in there if you don't like using the e key personally i would say get used to using the e key just because it's faster there's less room for error but, um, you know, teach their own. Just make sure that you use the parentheses if you don't like using this. Okay? Um, so moving on to number two.
proton and an electron are separated by a distance of 0 0.004 meters. Um, what's the what's the electric force between them? So, whew, excuse me, late at night here. Um, our K is nine times ten to the ninth. Q1 is an electron or a proton doesn't really matter. I I have it as an electron because it's negative here. So I'm getting that from up here. My proton is right here. And we should you should know from chemistry and from kind of our discussions earlier in the uh, in the unit that my electrons and protons they have the same value, the same amount of charge, just opposite charge though, right? Opposite sign. So an electron, it's got 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs of charge, and even though it's tiny in comparison to a proton, protons you know almost 2,000 times the size of an electron, they still have the same charge. It's just that my proton is is opposite. It's the positive version of that 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. All right, so that's where I'm getting these cues from. I should realize that it's a force of attraction, so I should come out with a negative F in the end, and that's sort of one of the things that should be on my mind even before actually solving the rest of the problem. Just realize, oh, because this is negative and this is positive, um, a negative p times a positive is going to give me a negative, a negative force, which means it's an attractive force, which makes sense because I've got a positive and a negative, or a proton and an electron is attracting. All right, so now I know my distance. Remember, the squared is part of the formula, so that's that's always there. So at this point, very similar to the previous problem, I'd say go ahead and do all of that math on its own, do this math on its own, and then divide the two. And you come out with negative 1.44 times 10 to the negative 23rd. And again, that negative means that it's a force of attraction. If it were positive, it would mean that it's a force of repulsion. All right, number three. particle has a charge of 7.2 times 10 to the negative 14th coulombs. It's 0.5 meters away from another charged particle. Let's determine the charge of the other particle when we um, when we put those two charges close together with a force of this. All right, so, or which will produce a force of this, I should say. So I know that this is a, another Coulomb's law problem because I'm dealing with two charges. I'm dealing with a distance. So that's my go-to formula here. If I had the choice between this and Q equals NE, Q equals NE does not talk about force, um, and it does not deal with two charges. So I've got my force, I've got my K, right? That's always the same, that's, a, that's the constant that's up off the screen at this point. Um, I've got my 7.2 times 10 to the negative 14th, that's coming from here move the screen over a little bit so we can uh, can see what else is going on here. Um, I know my distance of separation is 0.5. The squared is coming from the formula, not from the problem. That's always there. Um, and I'm solving for Q2. Right? And I also know my force. All right, so at this point, I would say just do anything you can to make things a little bit simpler. So don't tackle the whole problem at once. Let's just look at anything that we can do. So these two numbers, I could multiply. This down here, I could do take the, the squared value of, um, and that's what I did over here. 9 times 10 to the 9th times 7.2 times 10 to the negative 14th gives us the 6.48 times 10 to the negative 4th. Okay. Um, the bottom would be 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, or 0 0.5 squared, which is 0.25. So now at this point, let's see, is there anything else that we could do? I'd recommend getting rid of this 0.25. You know, how would you do that? Well, multiply both sides by 0.25, and you end up with uh, this 2.38. 2.38 times 10 to the negative fourth. That's what this 0.25 times 9 Point five times ten to the negative uh, fourth is. So then I'm left with that. Let me get rid of this just so it's a little bit more clear. So I'm left with this two point three eight times ten to the negative fourth, and again that was these two values equals six point four eight. Got a little bit muddy here. Six point four eight times ten to the negative fourth q two. 
how do I get q2 by itself? Um, again, don't don't ask yourself a question. Do I multiply this by this or this by this? Look at how do I get q squared by itself or q2 by itself, not squared. Sorry. Um, and that would be divide what it was multiplied by before, right? So divide both sides by 6.48 times 10 to the negative fourth. If I do it to one side, I've got to do it to the other side. You can write it as times 10 negative fourth or e negative four, either way. So that cancels, I'm left with Q2. Yeah. Q2 equals 0.367 after doing my division here. Now this number seems like it's a little bit big in comparison to my other charge, and, and it is, it's uh, quite, a, quite a bit bigger, but just realize that this value here is times 10 to the negative fourth, and this value over here is also times 10 to the negative fourth. When we have two values that are similar in size in terms of scientific notation, we're going to come out with something that's probably not in scientific notation. It's a little bit of a shortcut to sort of see if you're if you're on the right track. If you don't get that, that's okay. That's something that you'll pick up throughout the rest of the year in physics. Um, but it's something that you may want to start thinking about. And of course, to see if we're right, you could take this 0.367, plug it in for Q2, multiply, divide, see if it equals whatever this side is, which is 9.5 times 10 to the negative fourth. So you should come out with something pretty similar to that if it is correct. And let's take a look at number um, four. Two grains of sand are carrying the charge of this 2.2 times 10 to the negative 14th coulombs and negative 5.6 times 10 to the negative 13th. And they're separated by a distance, so it looks really, really familiar to those other problems, right? So I'm just dropping one charge in for Q1, dropping another charge in for Q2. I know my distance. That's what I've got right there. I know squared is part of the formula. And then again, just like the other problems, let's go ahead and do that top part, do the bottom part, and then divide the two, and you come out with this. Again, use that E key um, when, when putting things into your calculator scientific notation wise. So do the grains attract or repel? How the heck do we know that? Um, there's multiple different ways that we know that. So the first one is just realize what a negative force means. We don't actually have a negative force. What the negative represents is we do come out with a negative force mathematically, but conceptually the negative means that this is a for, uh, force of attraction. And that should make sense because I have a positive value and a negative value. Opposites attract. The other way that we could look at this is even before getting into any of the problem, we don't even have to do part A to figure this out. So we could look at what we've got going on up here. We've got something that has a charge of, doesn't tell us what if it's positive or negative, so we would assume it's positive, right? The other charge is negative, tells us explicitly uh, a positive and a negative, they're going to attract. So we could even figure that out even before doing the problem. And then for part C, which grain receives more force, or do they receive the same force? Um, this is actually going back to unit in first semester, the forces unit, uh, depending on how you count, and whether or not you include that, that intro unit that we did at the very beginning of the year, it's either the second or the third um, unit that we did. So Newton's third law still applies to this situation. You know, if I have two objects, they're pushing on each other with a force, well, that force is distributed equally among both of them, because if one object pushes one way, the other object pushes back with an equal but opposite force. Newton's third law still applies here, albeit it's a, a very, very small level that we're looking at, level of, uh, you know, subatomic level, but it still applies to subatomic level just like it does everyday sort of real world tangible objects. All right, um, so that is that's that in a nutshell. Number five, we're not really going to talk about right now. This is something that we'll we'll talk more about in class. I'm actually going to post a a different video that talks all about um, steps in charging a cloud until lightning strikes. But basically, what happens is you have some charging by friction that happens in the cloud. Um, just a very quick overview, and then. Um, 
after you get the charging bar friction occurring you basically have a charge buildup that causes the ground to polarize so the literal ground it's not like a grounding a grounding rod or you know grounding wire or grounding by just you know touching my finger to like an electroscope type of thing um, but the ground itself polarizes and then what we end up happening is electrical discharge and what that electrical discharge is better known to us as lightning so that's the three major steps um, there's quite a bit more to it than that uh, that's a way oversimplification of it people get their PhDs in physics and still don't understand lightning it's it's a phenomenon that um, is, is not fully understood we you know think we know the the basics of it but uh, this is a way 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 oversimplification of what's actually happening and there are multiple different types whether it's going from lightning going from cloud to ground ground to cloud or cloud to cloud um, but there's uh, there's ways of predicting what kind of lightning will happen um, in ways that they're researching currently on how we could actually harness the power of lightning in order to power large objects. Like I forget the statistic off the top of my head, but it's something like a, a lightning bolt would be able to power the city of Chicago for like a day or a week or something like that if we were able to actually harness the electricity from just a single bolt of lightning, which unfortunately we, we can't, but that would solve a lot of uh, the world's energy problems if we, if we could. So that's something that's being looked into. Kind of cool. All right, till next time.